Good morning. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Guten Morgen, Damen und Herren. My name is Mireille Carrera. I will be your master of ceremony for the next sessions and throughout the whole three days. Your Excellencies, Honorable Ministers, partners, sponsors of the next Einstein Forum, distinguished guests, it is an honor to serve as your MC today. As we heard today, this is an important gathering for the next three days, which we mark um, exhibition of the next scientists, the brightest minds that we have on the continent. Before I invite the next panel, I would like to quote His Excellency Paul Kagame, the president of Rwanda's um, quote from 2016, Next Einstein Gathering in Senegal. I quote, our continent's wealth tomorrow depends entirely on what we put in our children's heads today. They will lighten the world's burdens, not add them. Rwanda is pleased to be associated with this forum, which brings global partnerships and a truly Pan-African spirit to the task of building a knowledge-based African future. As we proceed to the next session, I would like to address your attention to the next plenary, which is called Playing Catch-Up, Accelerating Africa's Lab-to-Market Process. I would like to kindly invite these two people to come forward. The moderator for the next session, Ms. Lerato Mbele, presenter at Africa Business Report for BBC World News. Ms. Lera Tombele, if you could kindly come up. Please take a seat. For the opening remarks of this session, I would like to call upon Dr. Albert Zufak, Chief Economist for Africa at the World Bank. Welcome, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, I thought the coffee break gave us a little <laughs> bit more energy. So let's, let's, let's get started into this session on accelerating the process from lab to market. I'm Albert Zufak, I'm the Chief Economist for Africa, and I'm going to be telling you a couple of things that, from an economist perspective, could actually help Africa transition faster to uh, an innovation-led growth model. So first of all, it is for me a great honor uh, and pleasure to be here at the new Einstein Forum Global Gathering 2018 in Kigali. And I would like to express my profound gratitude for this unique opportunity to address you today and for the warm hospitality that you have extended. I'm humbled by your invitation to speak at this prestigious Global Forum for Science in Africa. And I really want to thank the organizers on behalf of uh, uh, Makta Diop, the Vice President of the Africa Region of the World Bank. As some of you know, Sub-Saharan Africa has experienced two decades of robust economic growth, despite some recent severe headwinds due to the slum in commodity prices. Growth forecasts in the coming years are encouraging. However, they are still far below what the region needs to keep up with growing populations and growing socioeconomic needs. In the latest version of the Global Economic Prospect, a biannual report produced by the World Bank, Sub-Saharan Africa is projected to grow at 3.2% in 2018. This is the first time since 2016 that GDP growth in Sub-Saharan Africa will be above population growth. Since 2016, we've been experiencing negative per capita growth. So Africa is recovering. Africa is recovering, although timidly. We definitely see a great potential for growth to be higher than 3.2% in Africa. 
In 2019, 2020, we expect, we project growth to be around 3.5%. And this positive prospect is underpinned by growth pickup in global economy, improvement in commodity prices, and a gradual strengthening in domestic demand conditions. Yet our region is still failing to achieve productivity-led growth rate. Growth that will be robust to shift, growth that will be robust enough to create resilience of our economies to volatile commodity prices. As we continue, the continent is still facing severe development obstacle on several fronts. And one of the key challenges is boosting agricultural productivity. Agriculture that still employ more than 60% of the whole African population. The other important challenge is producing skilled human capital affordably in order to power the continent. Key constraint to our growth is also to foster infrastructure development, improving market contestability, and formalizing financial services. These, among others, are obstacles that innovation and technology can help us address. And I think it's important to acknowledge that as we move forward in Africa, business as usual is no longer an option. Our countries need to leverage innovation to boost productivity and sustain growth. And in this fast-changing world, Africa cannot afford to stay at the margin, on the margin of technological advancement. And you know that African governments are already expressing strong political will to go beyond business as usual. Rwanda, as we gather all here in Kigali, Rwanda has been charting a new development strategy to transform this country into a knowledge economy. Technology is central to that strategy. And I think it is important to note that in that strategy Rwanda is putting in place, one of the goals is to attract one billion US dollars worth of ICT investment by 2020. And the country is also targeting technology-enabled companies operating in a variety of industries from fintech to smart energy grid to agri-tech and business process outsourcing. I think this is an inspiration for other countries in sub-Saharan Africa. It is important that we focus, our countries in sub-Saharan Africa, focus on the key elements to accelerate innovation, but also to accelerate the pickup of technology, the you know, adoption of technology. And let me suggest that there are four building blocks to speeding up the process of moving from the lab, from the idea to the market. The first one is building skills and capabilities. And when we say building skills and capabilities, we often focus on technical skills or technological capabilities. I would like to suggest that one aspect of skills that we have been lagging behind on is managerial capabilities. It is important for our innovators to know how to manage the transition from the idea to the market. The second building block is having a strong regulatory framework to allow innovation to take place. I think it is important to acknowledge that we are playing catch up at the title of this session is. None of our countries is ready on the regulatory side to actually welcome the knowledge-driven economy. 
None of our economies, and even more advanced economies are still struggling. I used to work in East Asian countries where I spent more than 10 years advising governments. Middle-income countries in Asia are also struggling with the right regulatory framework that would get them ready for the fourth industrial revolution, the right regulatory framework that would allow innovation to be protected and harnessed for gains. The third building block is forging the right partnerships. I think it is important to acknowledge that, and the president of Rwanda, Excellency Paul Kagame just said it earlier this morning, we cannot do it alone. And innovation, it's not a matter of just counting on one government's resources. We need to build the right kind of partnerships to be able to attract the right minds, foreign or local, to come into partnerships to create the knowledge, to harness all the innovation, and to translate it into goods and services that would further improve African lives. The fourth building block is governance. Listen, none of what we are saying would happen if there is no good governance in our countries. And it is essential for our governments to start thinking in terms of service to innovation activities. It is important for our governments to position our administrations to facilitate, not hinder innovation. It is important for our countries to relentlessly fight corruption. It is important for our countries to make sure that the administration and the civil service is there to serve the future innovators and help them translate in the, the, the ideas into products. The final building block that I would want to share with you is financing. But I would want to, sub, I would want to you know, submit to you, and this may come as a surprise. I'm an economist working at the World Bank. I would like to submit to you that of these five building blocks, finance is actually the least important. For if you get the four right, then finance will flow. It is my belief that when right, the, good, the right leadership, when good governance combine with strong partnerships, energies are liberated, ideas flow, and resources follow, including financial resources. So it is important for us to look at the process of innovation along these five lines and certainly work together to ensure that ideas generated by Africans, and there are plenty of these, are easily harnessed and turned into goods and services for the well-being of Africans but also of mankind. Let me just end by sharing a few things that the World Bank is certainly uh, doing in this area. The first is on building capacity. Building skills and innovation capacities, the World Bank is currently working with African countries to set up Africa centers of excellence and these are promoting STEM education, and they are strongly supporting linkages between universities and industry. So what the African Centers of Excellence is, as we call it, what these centers are doing, 
is leveraging $300 million that the World Bank has put on the table in 46 centers across 15 countries in the region. And this project aims at fostering collaboration among universities, sharing solutions, and training students across borders. Regional centers of excellence are an optimal way to build regional specialization, concentrate limited top-level faculty, generate knowledge spillover, and meet private sector demands for skills. We're striving to get the right incentive and tools for impact to help these universities respond to countries' development challenge. The ACE project has fostered the postgraduate expansion in Africa with more than 1,000 PhD and 5,000 master's students supported. The push towards high quality standards has resulted in at least 12 programs with international accreditation, including in Masters of Science degree in Water Engineering at 2IE, Center for Water in Burkina Faso, Masters and PhD programs in Cell Biology at the Centers for Infectious Biopathogens at the University of Ghana, and a Master's of Science degree in Power Engineering and Computer Science at the Center for Innovation Technology at the University of Yaoundé in Cameroon. This shows that African universities and scientists can meet and even exceed global standards. So, since this project started, at least 1,700 students have undergone one-month internship at utilities, hospitals, NGOs and international corporations. Another mechanism to support linkages is revenue generation through a matching grant approach. Universities are encouraged to reach out to industry and key players in their sector of offer you know, on contract-based research and consultancies for relevant applied research and education. At least five centers have won research grants of more than one million US dollars each in crop science, in genomics of infectious disease, in oil and gas, to name a few. So African Cent Africa Center of Excellence are leading groundbreaking research. The Africa Center of Excellence for Genomics of Infectious Disease which is based in the University of Redeemer in Nigeria, has published world-class research in the Ebola virus in nature science. This center tested the first sample of Ebola in Nigeria within a six-hour time frame. The strong capacity within applied research and training at Redeemer University was integral in battling the Ebola outbreak in Nigeria and the region. In November 2017, the center made globally available the genetic decomposition and tracking of the Lassa fever virus in Nigeria to help contain an ongoing outbreak. So it's happening, and it's happening in Africa. What it takes is a strong push to continue building these capabilities, technical and managerial. It takes the right regulatory framework to ensure that we do not stifle these bright ideas and bright initiatives. It takes, ladies and gentlemen, it takes a strong governance capability developed in each of our countries and a relentless fight of corruption. It takes the right and strong partnerships to make it happen. The World Bank as a partner for science, including in the area of agriculture and energy, it's doing its part, but it's looking forward to continue working with all our governments to make science lead the future of Africa. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Albert Zufak, for laying down building blocks for the first plenary discussion. At this stage, I would like to welcome Ms. Lerato to introduce our next panelist for this session. Ms. Lerato, welcome. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for this invitation. It is my greatest pleasure to be here at the next Einstein Forum. My name is Lerato Mbele from BBC World News, and it is just wonderful to be able to see and meet the future of Africa, the bright young minds in the room who are going to really catapult our economies and take them forward. Let me introduce to you our panelists who are going to discuss the topic of playing catch up, how to accelerate uh, from lab to market the processes here in Africa. We have in no order of importance, Dr. Virginia Ginger Smith Wunstowski, who is the Mental Health Global Program Leader at Johnson & Johnson's Global Public Health. Ginger, please make your way to the stage. So you can see I'm a bit of a feminist, so here we go. Miss Lucy Quist, please come up. She's the president of AIMS in Ghana. Then we have Dr. Johannes Frohoff, who's the president of Lab Central and the CEO of Cambridge Biolabs. He'll be joined by Dr. Engineer Haru Tadeka, who's the corporate chief engineer at Hitachi Limited. And finally, our host, Dr. Thierry Zomahun, who's the AIMS president and the CEO and NEF founder and chair. Thank you to you also, Dr. Albert Zoifak, for your submissions, your thoughts, because at least it gets us started. I've noticed that a lot of our moderators have started with quotes, so not to be outdone, I have my own. It's often said that people fear failure. But I hear, if you don't like failure, you will really dislike irrelevance much more. So this conversation we're having is about how to ensure that Africa is not irrelevant as the world moves into a new digital age that has been called the fourth industrial revolution. Ladies and gentlemen, you can see the clock before your eyes, so can we keep our answers short and succinct? Let's start off with the notion of whether it is easy to turn scientists into entrepreneurs. Let's start with you, Mr. Zumahun. That's essentially the catalyst. When scientists start to think like businessmen, is it an easy transition? Um, thank you, Lerato. Uh, I think nothing is easy, and there's no shortcut. Uh, we have to be deliberate about this. The, His Excellency President Paul Kagame uh, talked in his speech about two things that struck me. He uses the word ecosystem. And second, he said we cannot do this by ignoring a half of Afri more than half of African population, women. So on the, on the first one, what it takes will be a strategic, a systematic ecosystem in which you have education institutions, you have venture capitalists, you have um, investment, you have everything that it takes for, to uh, uh, really ensure the full spectrum of not just learning, but learning and help the learners to transition either into business or into research or into academia. That's number one. The second thing, uh, it's important, uh, he mentioned this morning, uh, a few minutes ago, that uh, women are left behind and the gender gap in the field of science is huge. We have all sorts of excuses to explain this, but no excuse is valid enough. So, and we know when you go across the countries in Africa, you go to Ghana, to Kenya, you go to Benin, to Togo, you go to South Africa, you see entrepreneurs, I would say, you know, Africans and particularly African women and girls are entrepreneurial. They have it in their blood. So what it's going to take, basically is to build that ecosystem to be deliberate and to have the right 
regulatory framework, the right policies which is uh, conducive to do science and to make it possible for scientists to choose to become entrepreneurs. Dr. Tadeka, your turn. It's often said that what governments are faced with the world over is this challenge of how to commercialize technology, how to take these great ideas in labs and create this ecosystem that's been spoken about. From your experience, how do you unlock that blockage? Um, I'm not doing uh, um, venture business, and uh, I'm working for a big company like Hitachi. And still, um, it's not very easy to connect uh, academia to uh, industries. Um, we have a gadget to combine academia and uh, 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 industries. It's called the Japanese Academy of Engineering. Um, in that academy, um, we have uh, scientists who won Nobel Prizes and um, executives of uh, Hitachi, Toyota, uh, Mitsubishi, so on, and the government, the Japanese government. And I, I think it, it is working for combining those uh, uh, three parties together. And I am um, prepared for the immediate answer to accelerate uh, African level to a marketplace. It's, the, it's uh, for African countries to have engineering academies like the one we have. Thank you. I think that's a fantastic answer. Let's stay on this tack, Dr. Frahoff. And the issue here is, you know, I've just mentioned the government. Let's talk about the universities. The world over, you see universities on their campuses having innovation hubs, having incubators, opening up those incubators to multinationals and corporates to come and pull the talent. Why is it hard to do in Africa if you know what the situation is like in Africa? Thank you. I think uh, that touches uh, upon the, the very important point is, you know, if, how can you enable people to use their smarts and then reach the real world? Um, first of all, we look at academic, academic institutions. Uh, they come up with, they, they train uh, hundreds and thousands of students. Um, and then uh, those during their graduate studies and maybe even postdoctoral studies, they invent uh, solutions. They write papers. They write scientific papers. That's their motivation. Um, I think a very important task that that we have is to make academic, academic innovation available for the real world. I work in this field uh, limited in biomedical sciences, uh, so that encompasses uh, drug development and medical device development and so forth. But, but I think some of the learnings that we see there can be translated into other areas. We are now translating those in, in engineering areas. Um, where, where we see one the topic that had been touched upon that oftentimes our scientists are not equipped to think about the, the world outside of academia. They are, they are, their incentive structures are very much focused towards writing papers because that defines their careers. I think um, he, here there's a lot of opportunity uh, available uh, through infrastructure and through policy to enable scientists to have entrepreneurial thinking, to empower them, to allow them. We, we call it a great idea, a revolutionary idea in cancer treatment, or malaria, or you name it. You have no financing. I want to tie this to uh, my friend's uh, uh, funding problem. You have no financing. I agree, commercial bank won't give you money for that. Uh, Airtel, Lucy was the CEO of Airtel because becoming the president of AIMS, won't give you money for that. MTN, forget it. So, what do you do? This speaks to the process you were talking about. 
this young scientist is at the stage of the chain, what we call, uh, that is called the value creation, uh, the knowledge creation. Between the knowledge creation and the knowledge valorization, that is from his or her bright idea uh, uh, to move from where it is to being piloted or prototyped and demonstrated, there's what we all know as the valley, valley of death. This is where most of great ideas die. But for that spot to cross the valley of death, it's imperative. Public funding is necessary. Okay. Anybody want to add to this one? I actually have two points. One to build on Terry's comment. So um, I think translational research is a core capability that absolutely needs to be built here. Um, companies are coming here to do that research, to take those ideas and to build them out to see that um, medications from a healthcare perspective are effective and safe and have the right PK profile, et cetera, um, and are appropriate for humans, what was seen in preclinical research. If you build that capacity here, I think, one, you'll be able to make money because companies will come to you and want to actually conduct their studies through you, and that income could then foster more innovation and more investment in science here. In addition, I think it's a, a mechanism for you to test your ideas. It's, we call it like fast to fail often, when we're taking molecules quickly, um, once we've established obviously that they're safe and effective, we're testing those new ideas, those new molecular targets to see if there's something that is a win and we should carry forward with the larger investment all the way through to the market, or if they don't meet that you know, very critical profile, then you quickly kill that and move to the next innovation. And you can control that narrative yourself by, by developing that core capacity. And one other thing I'd like to just add, if, you might, if I may, is that I think um, one, to answer the question about funding, it's actually sometimes difficult to know where the good science is happening here on the continent. And I think being able to build um, a network that's easily tapped um, by anywhere in the world, for example, clinicaltrials.gov, you can go on there and see what clinical trials are happening and a lot of information about those medicines um, so that you can right away know who you might want to contact that's working on something very exciting. So that's just another idea. I think it will come up in the next uh, session on blockchain technologies. I'd like to talk about something. You mentioned prototypes. And I was told that in a traditional world, developing and researching and building and refining a prototype can take five to 10 years. But if you consider how quickly technologi uh, technological innovations happen and shift, you know, six years ago, we're talking about hybrid cars. Now we're talking about electric cars. The pace at which this innovation is happening means that prototyping has to be faster and the funding has to come in quicker. How can we ensure African ideas are never redundant because of these seismic shifts? There will be ideas that will, take, will still take time, despite the fact that the context, the global context is moving very fast. It depends on the field in which new ideas are coming up. But I think, number one, having the adequate infrastructure and technical skills enables you to move faster. When you take the example of J&J &J and maybe some some labs across the continent, which provide young scientists or technologists to move faster in prototyping. It's, be, it's because they have the infrastructure, the equipment in place, and they have the environment which enables the young innovators to quickly move in there and pilot his or her idea. When you are in country context where you have no, you have poor infrastructure, lack of equipment, uh, in a in non-conducive regulatory framework. Of course, you may have the brightest idea. It may be an idea that could be prototyped in a very short time span. You won't be able to get it done. So when it, the second thing is about the funding. Again, I, be, I believe that uh, some companies, uh, like uh, some of our partners have been doing in Africa, some companies may have, may be interested in the idea. If you're sitting, in a village or in a small town, which is unknown, we're not talking about Kigali, we're not talking about Nairobi, 
and you're a bright innovator, you don't get the visibility. You don't get the opportunity to share your ideas. This is where the idea of ecosystem, national, regional, and pan-African ecosystem is important. Within the ecosystem, you get to be known, whether you're in Kigali or in Yamata, whether you're in Nairobi or in Yanza province, you get known. If you're not known, nobody will know what you're doing. Lastly, government public funding is extremely important to get you going. Before you build trust and you really interest, get a private sector interested in your idea being prototyped, being demonstrated, and being industrialized, we need, you need the public infrastructure right. to accompany. Dr. Tadeka, you've been quiet, so have you, Dr. Frahoff. Your views on really and truly how to just catapult big ideas to the next level. What's, what's the example in Japan, for instance, where a small idea becomes a big idea quickly? First of all, first of all let me ask a question. Are we talking about the market in Africa or in the world? We're talking about Africa, but we're learning best practice from the world. Yeah. Uh, um, actually, uh, you are ahead in terms of the uh, knowledge of the market in Africa. But uh, in terms of the market in the whole world, uh, those things are going on everywhere in the world. So if you want to... Um, um, definitely, you are, uh, we are talking about the next Einstein. So we are talking about the world. So um, we, um, as I suggested, uh, all you need is to have a partnership with the rest of, world, of, of the world. And uh, uh, I just, as I just said, uh, Academy of Engineering has the international community, uh, which is called the uh, International Council for Academies of Engineering and Technological Sciences. And there, uh, uh, industry people are um, substantial in, uh, uh, um, who are doing a substantial work in the world market. So uh, it's a nice place for collaboration, I think. So that's, uh, that's my suggestion. Fantastic. I, want, I want to comment on the question that was raised by Thierry and also Albert about government involvement and facilitation of, of investment. So I'm, I'm a venture capitalist. I do believe in the power of the, of the private capital. You cannot replace that with government action. But what we need is small and targeted and catalytic government investment to even enable uh, the setting of a stage at which uh, private investment can then start paying attention. I think very much we, we talk about the same thing, which is a small and well-placed government investment that builds upon a solid foundation of science education in school, which has to be there, then can enable innovators to stay. What currently happens is the smart kids all have to leave because they cannot develop their careers here. So um, even in Boston, where there's a lot of capital for, for the innovation economy, we have greatly benefited from a smart and small uh, investment by the local government into an innovation center that, that we now have, that is now the home and a magnet for smart innovators. It was a relatively small investment that has now yielded billions of dollars of venture capital that comes there. So I think the, these are some of the learnings that, that we can apply here because we have good willing governments who want to do the right thing and again, going back to Albert's uh, mention, this investment is, I wouldn't even call it a loss leader. This is a type of investment into education and capacity building that is going to pay huge rewards in the future and has to be done. And I have a final question, whomever can take it. 
What about intellectual property? You mentioned that many young scientists leave. I know certainly from my home country, I was told by the Minister of Science and Technology verbatim, I quote, that the bureaucracy so belabored in patenting ideas, licensing companies, is such that a great idea leaves because a scientist will find somewhere else to register it and start developing it. In Africa, it can take a year just to get the documentation filed onto the system, let alone painting. I, I think this area is a huge uh, area of opportunity for a young country like Rwanda, for example, right? If you are willing to rethink the process, here is one super effective way of dealing with this. Um, I, I work a lot with university technology transfer offices when they are in the process of, of protecting intellectual property that some professor has come up with and then trying to license this to the private sector, either big corporations or startups that are venture funded. And even in Europe and the US where I work, uh, there are huge differences in efficiency and they're very clearly and well-defined best practices that can be easily adopted and talk about leapfrog. Let's cut the bureaucracy. Let's go to the licensing agreement that's on the website where there are clear and predictable conditions for investors who need to know where their money is going and who need to know that they are likely to see success for their investment. Here's, here's one area where you can quickly adopt policies that have been developed somewhere and will yield large results. All right, we have a, just a few minutes left. So what I'll do is I'll break the room up into five and take five questions, if there are any, from the floor. We'll start over there. Are there any questions from the floor? Right at the back, if a microwave... Uh, microwave, hoo -hoo -hoo. <laughs> If a microphone can make its, its way all the way to the top, we'll take a question from there. Here in the centre of the auditorium, is there a question? I would have thought the women in the room are more courageous than that. On this side of the room... Two questions, if a microphone can make its way there. Two questions at the back. And finally up there, yes, sir. So the two gentlemen over there, if you can stand up. The gentleman on the, um, on the stairs, if you can stand up. And the gentleman over there. One lady, come on, come on, ladies. Right here with the green dress. Those are the five questions we're taking from the floor. Go ahead. Good morning, everybody, and just uh, an amazing panel of discussions. And uh, my question is related to protecting intellectual property in Africa. And I know that there's opportunities, like you referred to, um, to develop our own systems to protect and license our ideas. Uh, my question is about what about global uh, protection? Because sometimes we find, even when African scientists and innovators have protected their ideas, even in their countries, um, they don't have the resources to actually defend um, even those protections against uh, some of the um, other countries who come in and take those ideas to scale globally. and. Um, and, and this is a conversation, that's a question for the panel, thank you. Um, I have a microphone, can I ask a question and then pass it to him next? You've just <laughs> absolutely usurped the man's power, but go ahead. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. I'll bring you the microphone next. Uh, my name is Junior Kanamgire. Um, I'm an engineer, so I consider myself to be a scientist to a certain extent. And, uh, but I'm also an entrepreneur. Um, and uh, um, talking to the topic of translating scientists' minds into business in order to be able to create uh, sellable and marketable products. Uh, I can speak from experience to um, when I say that to be able to uh, develop a product that's sellable and understand the process of becoming an entrepreneur and a business person can be quite exhausting and quite difficult. Um, it takes quite a long time. But for scientists like myself who have very little training in business, I had a few suggestions that uh, I would like to share with the panel and you can tell me if it's feasible or not. On the topic of funding, for example, uh, I haven't mentioned that the rate of success is extremely high when it comes to developing new scientific or product, especially in the fields of agriculture or medicine. Why, um, 
can an institution like AIMS or NEF develop a fund that takes into consideration that specific loss ratio? And that will help um, 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 identify scientists that have interesting products, even though it might fail, you take that failure rate into consideration, that might help. And in a sense, uh, and the second aspect of um, creating business mind, going from a scientist to a business person, it can be a very painful process. So in the same mind, why not find uh, business minds, uh, experienced business people that can be paired with a scientist that could help them develop not only a, um, a sellable product, but also a product that can be marketed out there. So those are my two suggestions. Thank you. Fantastic. Sir, do you have a microphone now? Thank you very much. My name is Prosper Ahmed Amukwando. I work with the Ghana Energy Commission, and obviously I'm from Ghana. My background is theoretical physics and mathematics. From my experience as a science student at a high school to the university level, even to the postgraduate level, one thing that I have experienced in Africa or Ghana is the student is always not right in the classroom. It's always the professor. <laughs> And since today happens to be a day of quotes, let me also take my turn. <laughs> According to Sir Ken Robinson, a British educationist, he says, if you are not prepared to be wrong or to make mistakes, you will never come up with anything original. So, and again, if you are not confident in your own abilities, I'm sorry, it will be very difficult, if not impossible, to come up with anything original or to be innovative. Now, the first question. I will be very grateful from the panelists if you could share any best practices in other, other countries, maybe Rwanda, how you've been able to overcome this canker, modify your educational system, where in the classroom it becomes a period of teaching and learning for both the professor and the student. Please, question number two. The, one of the panelists talked about funding from the public sector being very important. And a sister, an African sister, also talked about intellectual property. F being able to protect your intellectual property globally. In fact, other countries, there are no patent or intellectual property laws. So in that case, especially from my experience again, you take an idea to a government official to pitch. After pitching, they tell you, okay, that's a nice idea. You hear from us. The next month or two months, you see that idea being repackaged and sold to the government. In such an environment, I have my idea. I would want to keep it. If you don't encourage me to keep it, what do I do? Thank you very much. I had it in mind to say, could all the university professors please stand up? <laughs> but I changed my mind. Okay, there were two questions on this side. Okay, thank you very much. I am Peter from Ghana, ambassador for Ghana. I'm a social scientist, and I'm happy to be here. My question is, when Lucy was speaking, she made emphasis that our governments are lackadaisical in accepting innovation from youth, and she recommended that there should be a change of attitude. But my question is, how do we make sure this change comes to pass. When you want a scientist, you train an engineer. When you want an engineer, you train somebody to be an engineer. When you want a mathematician, you train somebody to be a mathematician. But do you train somebody as a government personnel or somebody to have that skills for, as skills for governance in Africa? There's a large gap between what government can do and what industry also do. What I have observed is that we do not train anybody as a government. However, we train scientists. So if we want to achieve our aim as an African, and we want our government to support social innovation, we have to make sure we also call for social change where we train people as government experts. When the, the personnel from World Bank was speaking, he made emphasis of excellent centers in Africa. There was nothing like excellent center for governance or government in Africa. I think we should have a paradigm shift where we also focus on training such people. When they have the skills and ability, I'm pretty sure that they'll collaborate 
we set tests to make sure that the right. change we want can be effective. Thank you. Fantastic. And the last two questions. Yes, sir. Oops. Gentlemen, okay. You and then the gentleman above. Okay, thank Go. you. Uh, my name is David Jeng, I'm NEF ambassador from the Gambia. Um, I have a comment and a question. Uh, my comment is I believe that there should be a robust ecosystem that will identify all the challenges because if you look at Africa, the market is available. We have the availability of the market. So what we need to do is to develop a pool of hungry innovators that will not just only address the market, but also move the other way around, going to the market, not only from the lab to the market, but from the market also to the lab, because it's a two-way. So it's not an easy process, as the founder of NEF said, but I believe that it's possible. And to unlock this, innovators should be guided across the process, should be guided, not only guided, but also rewarded. So my question is, today we are discussing catching up. So what are some of the specific actions that innovators and governments should take to ensure that when we meet in two years' time, we'll be discussing Africa leading the way. Thank you. Last one. Hello. And the final question. Yes, sir. The gentleman on the stairs. Hello? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, my name is um, Kingston Yamaferi. I'm the president of the African University of Science and Technology. Um, my, I have two questions. They are also sort of like a comment. The issue of partnerships between academia, industry, and the government. Um, at almost every forum of this nature that I have attended, that has been raised as an issue. So it sounds to me almost like three people having a conversation about the same issue except sitting in three different rooms. I don't know what we can do to facilitate that relationship. Um, there are a couple of really good examples um, in some parts of the world, and the two that come to mind immediately. One is the CSIRO in uh, Australia, and then its equivalent, the CSIR in South Africa. The Center for Scientific and Industrial Research. That relationship was facilitated both by government and the private sector itself. Because there's a tendency, particularly in industry, to think people at universities don't really know how to come up with practical solutions. So they are considered redundant, irrelevant. When in fact, if you approach those people, you will find that they can be a matching and marrying of ideas that could lead to the innovation that you need. The CSIRO, the CSIR have been successful because they identify problems and then look for people who can provide solutions. Universities sometimes find solutions for problems that don't exist. So I think we need to find a way to facilitate that relationship. The, the second and last point, um, at my own institution we've created an innovation hub, and one of the important elements for me, uh, which I think gets forgotten a lot in this type of conversation, is the talent that exists in Africa on the periphery, people who are not part of mainstream education, people who are inventing things out there, people who are fixing things out there, and in our innovation hub, we're creating a space where people like that can participate. Thank you very much for all your questions. If we can just go through them very quickly. Um, let's start with the question raised by the lady who wants to take it on intellectual property that, you know, all over the world, people have great ideas. When they get stolen, they can't defend those ideas. And that's where the thing starts to unravel. Yeah, I don't have an easy answer for that, but it is a real problem because I think for investors, they are going to look for global rights to be able to fully realize the commercial potential of your invention. Um, and you're going to want that as well as the inventor because that's greater value back to you. So I don't have an easy answer because it actually applying for those global um, big countries to protect your IP can be quite expensive, millions of dollars actually, um, to be able to file that and, and continue to pay those fees. So there, if this, um, I agree, this is 
actually such an important, these are your assets, these are your ideas, this is your, um, this is your value, right? And uh, you want to hold that, so there needs to be some, just to build on Johannes's uh, comments that, you know, there needs to be some process in place to protect that and funding around that because it can be very expensive. Anybody want to help with that one? No. Oh. Uh, intellectual, in, intellectual properties uh, should be um, kept in the market where markets are. So um, if you don't market, it's a very big problem. So that's why I'm um, talking about the collaboration with uh, industries um, which have uh, markets for, uh, uh, for those in intellectual properties. A challenge was set to the AIMS president and the NEF. Why don't you create a fund? Even if you lose money, you will have learned a lot from those experiences. Create a fund. Help the scientists. The fund is created. <laughs> no, I, I think, let me step back and speak to the first point of the gentleman from Ghana talking about what is happening in the classroom on the, in the amphitheater. Uh, actually, he's talking, speaking to the educational systems. We all have experience, be it here or in Europe, Western countries. We, if we want to really go from lab to market, and we want to position Africa in a knowledge-based economy, one thing is extremely important. It starts with transforming the way we learn. Because the way educational systems and the way universities or higher education schools have been designed and set up, it's through a rigid pedagogy of a mechanical memorizing to get a degree. You learn, you get a master's degree, you get a PhD, and you're not employable. You get a master's degree, you get a PhD, you can't write one page. You get a master's and a PhD degree, you can't communicate. So the, the, uh, the, the, the friend from the World Bank says, there's one big uh, uh, prerequisite, which is managerial skills. And by managerial skills, I guess he's not talking about having a manager or a boss there running everyone. So these simple things, how can you uh, translate your ideas, prototype your ideas, translate them, make them of relevance to your communities if you don't have those managerial skills. So this is where, in the ecosystem we're talking about, we need to change the whole way of approach to doing science. The funding of creation <coughs> is also important yeah. because some would say we cannot just expect government to come in. This is why we need to get, uh, you know, uh, funding mechanism instrument in place. But is that, uh, again, won't be easy. Uh, we have it will take a process and take some time, but this is something deliberately that AIMS and NEF has within sight as part of our AIMS industry initiative program. The fourth and sixth question uh, were quite related. Maybe you can take this one, which is the change of mindsets that governments need to have. But more than that, can government, the private sector, and the universities speak in one room, not three different rooms, just come together and really actualize these partnerships? So, um, thank you very much. I think these are excellent questions. On, on the learning, I think this is a fundamental point. We cannot build those skills, be them technical or socio-emotional that Thierry was referring to, if our kids are not learning in school. And the World Bank just came up with a world development report about learning and when it comes to Africa, we are actually going through a learning crisis. While access to education has been tremendously improved over the, over the past 10 years, what we are seeing is that the quality of education in primary and secondary is actually going down. We have tested the teachers in a number of classrooms in Africa, across Africa, and you'll be surprised to read this result. In some countries, teachers do not are not able to have 50% of the answer correct to a test that they are teaching students. Not even 50% right. So that we call a learning crisis. So 
it's good to all agree here that we need to build technical skills, uh, you know, you know social emotional skills, but we need to start with the basics. Our kids need to be learning when they are in class. And that means teachers have to be in class. And in some countries in Africa, the rate of absenteeism of teachers, it's more than 50%. In some villages in Uganda, we have the numbers on the World Bank website. It is not acceptable. So the learning crisis needs to be addressed if we are to generate the next Einstein in Africa. We need our schools to be teaching. We need our kids to be learning. Now, when it comes to government, I think it's important for government to also learn. A government that represses the private sector in manufacturing or in uh, industry or any energy sector will also repress innovators. So it is important for our government to really internalize this private sector-led economy as being the future. I think, I think that mindset has to be uh, certainly changed and it has to be changed including in government schools, in government, you know, the go in schools training the administrators in our countries. And at the World Bank, we are actually taking a, a keen look you know, through our governance improvement program to make sure what our administrators learn in their school inter, inter, integrates right. all these uh, novelties. Thank you. Director, can I make a quick point to that? I think this failure of education, and I'll specifically use the example of Ghana because I like specifics, is an example of how we need to chart our own path, right? I was a schoolgirl in Ghana, uh, what, 30 or more years ago, when this, the, the, the external intervention of expanding education in Ghana was born. I was part of the last group of people who had the old system and the new system that was imposed on Ghana was introduced, and this was the beginning of the end. So do I believe that we need to expand education to, get, um, uh, to be more inclusive? Yes, but that intervention, in my view, and I've said it repeatedly, was a failure because it wasn't homegrown. It didn't take into um, consideration the entire ecosystem of producing teachers, facilities, I could go on. And that is why we are where, where we are today, and I suspect many countries are in the same position too. So let us make sure that when we have partners, we use use our own contextual right. knowledge to make sure that the solutions are appropriate. And the final question, I'm going to intellectually steal it, apologies, which was the specific actions. I think that's a very important thing. We've been discussing problems, complications. Let's talk about the solutions. The one specific action that can be taken so that when you next have this forum of global leaders, we're not discussing these problems anymore. We've moved on. First specific action from you, Dr. Zomon. Uh, simple. Reinvent the learning environment across the continent. Make it possible for learners and teachers to be agents of facilitations of knowledge acquisition and knowledge creation and build skills for the 21st century. Specific action to be taken, Dr. Tadeka. Um, I'm not in the academia, so I'm not uh, sure about that. So, um, okay. Can, uh, can I pass That's it also to fair the next to say. Specific action. I, I would build on Thierry's comment, and I would, I would further specify, I think if you are looking for short-term um, improvement, uh, entrepreneurship training is going to be very impactful on, for scientists for sure, but also for a much larger, uh, much larger group of, of young people. Uh, um, bring them in collectives, teach them, have mentors from different sectors of business, learn, teach them to learn the language of business mm -hmm and how to sell their, new, their own ideas. It's going to be very empowering and you can make progress in a short period of time. Yeah, I think that applies to all of us. Lucy, specific actions. Um, 
Two really quick ones. Regulation and finance. I think that for our innovators, they do need a degree of protection in their own local markets. It's happened all over the world, so I'm not calling for something that hasn't happened. They need protection in their markets to really grow their business. And the second one is on funding. We keep thinking of um, government and external venture capitalists. I would really implore African investors... You know, the people, who, the people in this room who are investors who are put their, putting their money on various stock exchanges, let's start investing in our own. Let's put our money back into Africa. Ginger? Specific action? Yes, um, I think uh, establishing south to south um, scientific networks, uh, just really strengthening those networks, shared learnings, best practices, and then making that transparent to the world so that you can attract people that know what's going on and they're going to want to come and invest. And specific action? Two specific actions. I believe it will be a great leap forward if by the next forum, all, if not, most African countries would have adopted a regulatory framework protecting innovation in our respective countries. Second, it would be extremely helpful if our governments would set in place specific financing mechanism for innovation in our countries, work in collaboration with the public, with the private, and other international partners. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope we've stimulated some thoughts, some debate. We've been discussing playing catch up, accelerating Africa's lab to market process. I thank you all for your questions. I thank you all for your patience. And more importantly, I thank the submissions of our panelists. Let me remind you who they are. Dr. Albert G. Zoifak from the World Bank. Seated next to him, Dr. Virginia Ginger smith Wunstonski, who is uh, from Johnson & Johnson's Global Public Health Program. Seated next to her is the effervescent Miss Lucy Quist, the president of Ames in Ghana. Seated next to her is Dr. Johannes Freuhoff, who's the CEO of Cambridge Biolabs and the president of Lab Central. Seated next to him is Dr. Engineer Haro Takeda, who's the corporate chief engineer at Hitachi. And finally, Mr. Thierry Zomahun, who is the president of Ames, the CEO and founder and chair of the N. E F. You've been great. Thank you. Thank you.